let's talk about, first of all, why we need Wi-Fi. Nobody wants to be tied to their desk anymore. And there is an increased demand for our flexibility in workspace and productivity. No, in, again, in no one wanting to be tied to their desk anymore, we need to have the flexibility of being able to leave our desk and be portable in our workspace. In addition, wireless gives us the capability of having faster response to our customer needs. We no longer, again, need to be tied to a physical location to solve problems, receive phone calls, and resolve customer issues. There's also an increased demand for collaboration, being able to walk into a conference room and meet with mixed groups of people uh, on a combined project. And of course, our expectation has grown to the point where we now expect wireless connectivity in our workspaces and in our personal lives. That all important Facebook check-in from the coffee shop or the donut shop. So we know all too well uh, this notion of a wireless personal area network. Many of us know it as Bluetooth, or we know it as Apple Pay, or we know it as the app that we have on our phone that helps us pay for our favorite coffee beverage at our favorite uh, vendor that provides that coffee beverage. Wireless personal area networks have a range of anywhere between five and 10 meters. So a typical use case for this is Bluetooth technology. Wireless local area networks focus on the ability to connect an AP to a switch and either have it managed by a wireless LAN controller or act autonomous of a wireless LAN controller, and they are said to have a range of less than 100 meters. So the radio waves being emitted from the wireless access point, either in an autonomous architecture or a centralized architecture, uh, have the ability to travel out to about 100 meters. 100 meters is also the distance that we can connect a wired uh, infrastructure endpoint into the network before the digital signals actually start to degrade over time. Wireless metropolitan area networks have a range of greater than 100 meters, and these are largely used by municipalities, uh, first responder networks, uh, city uh, and municipality management of things like water system and solid waste and, uh, you know, uh, occasionally you'll uh, find that uh, they are used for, um, they are used for uh, just other infrastructure services within a, a metropolitan area. There are also some cities that actually have Wi-Fi services available to the, uh, to the uh, citizens that make up a municipality. So that would be a wireless metropolitan area. Now it's important to note that all three of these different kinds of wireless networks, whether we're talking about wireless personal area network, wireless local area network, or wireless metropolitan area network, all operate according to some technology base. And, um, and in the case of wireless metropolitan area networks, those are typically a different radio architecture than a wireless local area network. So for example, in a wireless local area network, we typically used, we typically use frequencies that are non-licensed, but in a wireless metropolitan area network, we will use radio frequencies that are in fact licensed to that municipality. In terms of architecture, <clears throat> going back to this notion that wireless doesn't necessarily require an access point, we arrive at this notion of what's called an ad hoc network, which presents what's called an independent basic service set. Independent basic service set effectively means that there is no AP required and that there is a, a device that actually acts as the facilitator of the wireless network and connects to another device that acts as the receiver of that service. That's what's called an independent basic service set. We're gonna compare that and contrast that to what's called a basic service set and an extended basic service set. We'll, we'll get into that. In an ad hoc network though, uh, there is no need for an access point because the wireless devices effectively marry to one another 
and uh, communicate by way of wireless technologies. Wi-Fi Direct is a good example <clears throat> of an ad hoc network because in a Wi-Fi Direct environment, this gives me the ability to take a wireless device and connect it to another wireless device for the purposes of printing, for the purposes of sharing information. So many of you uh, probably have Apple TV, and you know that Apple TV gives me the ability to take effectively content on my portable device and then uh, put that up on a screen by way of the Apple TV box. That's a, that's a good example of Wi-Fi Direct. Another example of that is direct to print. So certain printers have a, the ability to receive wirelessly uh, print jobs from a portable device and actually display that, right, or, or actually present that in printed form. I actually have a client that uses uh, Wi-Fi Direct or uh, an ad hoc network to actually print from his iPad to his printer. So it gives me the ability to, uh, uh, to share screens or to share a printing device. So these are all examples of an ad hoc network. And you'll notice the absolute uh, vacancy of a uh, access point. There is no access point in any of these architectures. Now, what most of you are familiar with is what we call infrastructure mode. So in infrastructure mode, either with one or more APs, we have an access point that is effectively a radio that is providing wireless services to any connected clients. And we're going to talk about how clients actually join up, authenticate, and associate, I'm sorry, associate and authenticate to a wireless architecture. Of course, in infrastructure mode, Again, single AP or multiple APs, we have, the, uh, we have the wired connection between the switch and the AP. Uh, and, and we'll talk about here in a little bit uh, the actual switch port configurations for connecting an AP. And that's going to largely determine whether or not the AP is uh, being controlled by a controller or not being controlled by a controller. Now, Moving to that point, a lightweight AP, lightweight meaning that the AP requires the presence of a wireless LAN controller, which you see here in this drawing, is going to be facilitating the function and the operation of this AP. An autonomous AP is said to be a AP that effectively presents its own wireless network without the presence of a controller. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to both, but in either case, when we have a single AP operating in infrastructure mode, what we have is what's called a basic service area. And folks, the basic service area is nothing more than a wireless service that is presented around the AP to wireless clients that are going to be connecting to it. A basic service area being the cell that the wireless access or that the access point actually creates is provides a basic service set. So a simple way of thinking about this is that a basic service area is the wireless coverage of an AP. The basic service set is the set of services that is offered by that basic service area. So it's important not to confuse a basic service area with a basic service set for this reason. A basic service area is nothing more than the wireless signal that is present for attached devices, but it, uh, it is the, uh, but it can have multiple uh, wireless local area networks represented by service set identifiers, which we're going to talk about here coming up. And, uh, and again, you'll note that the wireless LAN controller is, in this case, optional. Not a lot of networks that have single AP infrastructure mode wireless services. What is more common in most of our environments, whether it be our work environment, even in our home environments, where we have multiple APs, which are uh, either A, connected back to a wireless LAN controller, or B, acting autonomously of a wireless LAN controller that, uh, that we have a wireless capability for our connected endpoints. 
This gives us the ability to actually roam around in an environment and never lose wireless connectivity. Multiple APs, of course, connect to a wired infrastructure, which is what makes it an infrastructure mode or an infrastructure modality environment. Our wireless LAN controller is an optional piece. When we do have a wireless LAN controller, the APs actually are lightweight, meaning that they rely upon a connection to the wireless LAN controller, or they can be autonomous. Now, if they're autonomous, they have to be managed as independent endpoints presenting a wireless service to our clients. A multiple AP infrastructure mode architecture presents what's called an extended service area because I've effectively extended the reach to my wireless clients from a single AP to multiple APs. Now, what's interesting about this is that an extended service area presents an extended service set. In most of our use cases, multiple APs are in fact going to be controlled by a controller. When we think about an SSID, we know it as a, an SSID is nothing more than a service set identifier. It's a way for the access point to say, hey, here are, the, uh, here are the services that I'm offering to anyone that can connect up. So a service set identifier, you can think of as a box or a container that we put particular attributes within. Among those attributes <clears throat> is going to be the, uh, the mechanism by way we uh, authenticate, uh, the mechanism by which we associate, and the control mechanisms that the AP is actually presenting to our wirelessly connected clients. So when we have wirelessly connected clients connected up to an SSID, what they are in effect connecting to is the presence of a wireless local area network. And you say, well, gee, Jim, how does all that work in relation to uh, the way that wireless devices actually communicate with the AP, and I'm so glad you asked that question. There's this notion in wireless networks where we split the MAC architecture between what's called real-time traffic and non-real-time traffic. Let me take a couple of moments to explain the difference. Real-time traffic is said to be the traffic flowing between an AP and a connected client, and it includes things like the frame exchange. So again, as clients uh, send and receive frames, there's a whole process whereby the, uh, the, the connected client has a portion of time, because again, in wireless, uh, time is the uh, constraining factor. So <clears throat> each associated and authenticated client has a, effectively a time slot that, it, uh, use, that is used to associate it to that particular SSID on that particular uh, AP. In addition, we also have the SSID broadcast, which is said to be uh, effectively a management type of frame, and that's the AP saying, hey, here are the uh, wireless local area networks that I am presenting to you to be consumed and utilized by you. In addition, what's also happening here with regard to real-time traffic is the, uh, in this particular case, with the presence of a wireless LAN controller, the wireless LAN controller is actually managing those client connections, okay? And, uh, and the AP is reporting back to the wireless LAN controller the presence of interference, the presence of noise, and all kinds of other attributes that the wireless LAN controller is then running algorithms on internally to effectively manage the airspace between uh, not only these APs, but any other uh, interferes that might be present in this space. The non-real-time traffic is things like association and authentication. So one of the first things that happens in a wireless architecture is a client will have to, first of all, discover wireless networks or wireless LANs as presented by an SSID. Uh, it will have to then authenticate if I have such authentication set up, and those are all 
configurable values that I put into the wireless LAN controller. And what happens is the wireless LAN controller then communicates that to one or more APs, and we have the capability to actually choose that in the wireless LAN controller. It puts that information out there. What's also happening inside the wireless LAN controller is the radio frequency management. So, for example, if I have a particular set of radio channels that are busy or noisy or whatever the case might be, the wireless LAN controller actually has the capability of changing that in a dynamic way such that connected clients have uh, clear air upon which to communicate uh, back to the AP. What's also happening here is the security and quality of service attributes that the wireless LAN controller is actually pushing out to these APs relative to client connection. And it's also important to note that, uh, that in this architecture right here, uh, and let me just kind of uh, focus in on this relationship again. For example, uh, one of the things that's become even more prevalent in our wireless architectures or wireless spaces has become the need for security. So, Encryption is actually happening or can happen uh, right here between the wireless access point and the connected client. So that's where encryption is actually happening. It's important to note, though, that with regard to association and authentication, that is actually done by the wireless LAN controller. Also important to note is this idea that in an IEEE 802.11 frame, which is a standard wireless Ethernet frame, there are up to four populated MAC addresses. Normally, a wirelessly connected client will utilize three of those four MAC address spaces in the wireless frame. Those being the source and destination MAC address, just like it would in any other uh, 802.3 LAN architecture, the source and destination MAC address, and then the MAC address of the SSID that is being transmitted by any given AP. So um, now, where it's used, where the fourth MAC address is actually used is in special AP circumstances that are, that are using what's called mesh connectivity. The AP, in this case, is gonna act as the bridge, right? So as I have wireless clients actually connected to the AP, the AP is actually going to convert the 802.11 frame that carries these four populated MAC addresses, or up to four populated MAC addresses, and it's going to actually convert that to 802.3 traffic going into the distributed architecture back in here, usually back to the wireless LAN controller. It's also important to understand that each SSID presented by each unique access point is going to have its own MAC address associated to that.